Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast, IDP. You hear me? IDP edition today. Getting weird. I'm Ian Hart. It's joining me as always, the one, the only Dwayne Booger McFarland. Dwayne, how are you? <laughs> Definitely Dwayne Booger for this particular episode. That was very classy, Ian. Um, I would expect nothing less. Man, I am so excited for this podcast because I have a home league, two home league drafts this weekend, John. And uh, people don't know who John is yet. But anyway, there's going to be a guy named John you guys are going to hear about in a minute. And guess what? There, so it's Dynasty, but it's IDP. Um, and yeah, so like I haven't studied at all for my draft because i've been doing all the other stuff on offense so i've been reading your tiers and stuff they're freaking badass i must Damn. say and so i'm gonna be i'm gonna be ready but here you go ian let me john to you now john that i screwed your whole <laughs> intro up <laughs> thanks thanks Dwayne. really uh really set me up to thrive there fellow analyst from pff the idp king himself john macri at pff underscore macri John, you truly are the IDP king, man. And I just want to say, because I everyone knows I hate kickers, and a lot of times the bounce back to that is like, oh, yeah, like defenses suck too. Like, no, I am not saying that at all. This is completely <laughs> different. I am back in the day when I put that – I've got my U Chicago shirt on right now. 51, that's a linebacker number. That's a real yeah. linebacker number. I love defense. That's where the kings play. And, John, you know, hat tip to you, man. You are – all you want in this world is for defensive players to get some fantasy love, man. That's it. That's all I ask. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you guys. Uh, you guys having me on. I'm, I'm excited to be here. I, I consider this the best fantasy football podcast out there. So I'm, uh, I am blessed to be with you fine gentlemen today and excited to talk some, uh, some defensive players. Hopefully, you know, the numbers don't too, take too big of a hit once uh, people see the letters IDP in their feed, but uh, we'll have some fun along the way at least. And everyone, as always, on PFF.com, you can reference all of John's material. I mean, if you think, like, for example, Dwayne's pretty good at his job, and I I, I agree with that notion, uh, you look at John's material and you're going to see, in my opinion, like a lot of the same sort of tiers-based, utilization-based stuff that Dwayne does. John, you know, providing similar uh, just content on, on the IDP side of things. So that's what it is, guys. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to go out there and say, oh, these are my – top 10 players at every position this year. But when you actually take the time to tear it out, look at all the variables, you know, m maybe not quite as sexy as a Twitter thread, but I do think uh, getting through <laughs> all that amount of work will ultimately lead to the best results. So with all that said, John, just before we get into too much nitty gritty, like how long have you been playing and analyzing IDP and like what made you interested in the first place? So I guess for me, um, I, I mean, it started with just like a love of, of, football and and fantasy football and and as much as i enjoyed playing like offense only leagues um the the group of friends that i i started playing in an idp li league with we were all kind of we're pretty big degenerates and, and we wanted to do uh something even even deeper um so that took us down the kind of the idp rabbit hole and then that's been i guess now over a decade probably 12 Ooh. something years um so yeah we started our, our first idp league as like a full 50 man dynasty roster where you start 11 idps across all five positions so just kind of jumped in uh with with both feet and it was kind of sink or swim at that point but uh luckily i learned the format pretty quickly and, and fell in love with it and, and haven't looked back Dwayne, thoughts uh, well, man, I've been playing since 2005. Those are my, sorry, nice. Ian, your video is super grainy. We can cut that part out later. So I don't know if you've got a bad connection or not, but I just thought I'd throw it out there. Um, I've never seen it like this before. Okay. I will make a note of that. We will right, cut so this up. Right. Yeah, we can cut that out, but Wait, I, don't, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Go ahead and just respond to whatever you want to say after John Spiel. Yeah. And go. Cool. Yeah. So, um, Super excited, John, to have you here. Uh, I've been playing IDP since like 2005, 2006. And back in the day, it was just like, um, you know, it was just honestly just kind of this little courtesy token thing. Like, oh, we should probably pay attention to defensive players. And we had like three, right? So it didn't matter. You could pick one up on the waiver wire. Like, you know, Brian Urlacher's like sitting out there on the waiver yeah. wire, like on week three. You're like, oh, I'll pick this guy up. The score's 20 points a game. He's like a running back. Um, but then like it slowly became more and more and more. And I, you know, I've got a bunch of buddies that I play in this home league with that like really love football. And so, yeah, man, having you on, it's freaking awesome because now we start three linebackers, three DBs, um, three defensive linemen and we have like three flex it's nice. yeah it's like nuts so it's a super deep league and man like i said i'm not prepped so i'm getting prepped <laughs> right here with you today live yeah we got you we got you don't worry so i think one of the issues that people have with 
IDP individual defensive players and just maybe defense special teams in general is our unfamiliarity with the scoring kind of involved. So John, how kind of constant is the scoring? Because I've gone through, you know, some articles and the one I saw you reference, basically the defensive linemen are getting the most points per tackle and per assisted tackle. Cornerbacks and safeties also get more points per individual tackle than the linebackers. Otherwise, it's four points for a sack, one point for a TFL, one for a QB hit and two for pass breakup. So just from looking at that, to me, it seems like we're looking for either the elite edge defenders that can just get after the quarterback or the sideline sideline linebackers that are just racking up one tackle after another. Yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, IDP leagues and scoring, they come in all different shapes and sizes as, as do most fantasy leagues, but there's, there's not really like a standardized scoring for, for IDP. And and some people hate that. Some people don't love it because they like the the variety. Um, But for this one specifically, I I think what it was meant to kind of do for me anyways, that I found was kind of level the playing field, uh, um, across all IDP positions because in like a tackle heavy league where everybody scores the same for tackles I mean the majority of defensive linemen become a bit of an afterthought um, despite them being one of the more valuable positions in in real football so um, this kind of creates a more balanced scoring overall and 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 when you look at the top scorers at the end of the season there's a fairly even mix of linebacker defensive line and defensive back in there because the scoring plays uh, to each position strength and doesn't just rely on tackles being the primary focus for your league which usually means linebackers the only one so that's that that's your ideal scoring but if you yeah. are in an idp league where tackles are weighted evenly yeah. now we're looking at a situation where the linebackers deserve to be pushed well above oh, everyone yeah. else okay absolutely yeah as they should yeah, be dwayne the linebackers are the most <laughs> badass players on <laughs> the football field come on we can, we can have fullbacks there too but you know what it's 2022 we unfortunately don't see them as often but yeah. yeah what position did you play in college Ian? Oh, you know, you know, yeah. Mike, baby, I had to call. I'll tell you what, man, like you in high school, we had three plays. I get to college and all of a sudden we had like eight formations. I'm supposed to set everyone up. I, man, tough, tough business guys. You should, there should be points for the play caller out there. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Getting it Linebacker's off, uh, tough, man. It, it, it's a, it's a tough position to play in the NFL. And that's why we see them. They don't usually grade that well for us either. So. Yeah. And, and most leagues, you know, it, they are tackle heavy. I, I agree yeah. like with the weighting and that's how we do it. So like um, it's kind of like being in a tight end premium league. Ian. so like uh, defensive linemen get one and a half points per tackle. And then we give one point, you know, for the linebackers just to try to kind of to John's point, like you're just trying to bring everything, you know, together. Uh, the other thing, you know, is just, you know, trying to give more points for sacks and things like that, where we know the edge rushers, you know, that's really where, you know, they can pop. So like we give six points for those instead of four, you know, in one of the leagues that I play in just it, it's. It's just like like we wouldn't give quarterbacks a point for every you know ten yards, right? That then all of a sudden we would all just have quarterbacks, right? That's why running backs get you know a point for every ten yards in most you know uh, leagues that we play in. Same thing for receivers, and then that's really where PPR came from. Probably went too far the other way, but why you know we wanted to help bring the receivers up with the running backs of course you know we weren't anticipating i think at the time like the running backs that also catch 100 passes in a ppr format and then also go off for like 1400 yards rushing cheat code this is a cmc tweet if it were a tweet yeah are there examples john of like like was jalen smith maybe like two years ago actually like pretty damn good in idp despite being like pretty horrendous in real life yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like for for linebackers, like they don't have to be particularly good at their job to be uh, good IDP assets. They just kind of have to be on the field, right? A tackle, uh, the way we we kind of joke about it, is more something that happens to a linebacker as opposed to the linebacker actually having to actually do something right because um they're just on the field for for every snap and obviously that's becoming less and less as the league shifts a little bit to more defensive back heavy but yeah you don't have to necessarily be a good linebacker for idp purposes i'm a, i'm a reading uh you'll know his name Dwayne Miller, bill bates the cowboy safety from uh oh, yeah. the 80s or so bill bates. do i, I remember I, him i think it was a john madden book and he had a chapter about bill bates in there but like bill bates was making the point where like he led the team in tackles like his second year and he was like guys i played safety like your safety should never <laughs> never ever lead your team in tackles but hey if you're gonna be able to get those points why the hell not now this is convenient uh john because you had your dynasty ranks go up in the end of may i'm i, I know you tinker throughout the year but just at that point in time your top five was nick bosa miles garrett tj watt aaron donald and chase young is it is the reason why we're kind of top putting those guys at the top because of the potential for the huge sack years and just the reality that we kind of see these defensive linemen have longer careers than the linebackers that's definitely a part of it um i think yeah as far as dynasty ranks go i mean if anything 
the you know the way that I like to address my rosters and, and attack positions first is with those elite defensive linemen just because as much as there are a lot of edge rushers in the nfl not all of them can be considered like consistent um producers that we can just kind of lock into a into a starting lineup and and trust week to week because there's so much sack luck that we have to to rely on so I personally like the guys that have those kind of stable metrics that we know we can rely on year to year and then kind of load up on that. And then for linebackers with just being a high turnover rate um, and being super replaceable in season, once injuries start to happen, you could find guys on the waiver wire who could just step in and, and play and, and produce similar numbers. So uh, I like to get the guys that are, that are harder to find in season and uh, attack that in the draft first. Reasonable so to think, like, sorry, real quick, Ryan. Re- reasonable to think of these like high upside sack edge defenders as like, you know, the three down running backs at the top of drafts. Yeah. Yeah. In a way. I mean, there, there's like, like I said, there's a lot of guys that get sacks, but not a lot of guys that we can trust to do it, uh, like feel good about doing it every single yeah. week. And, and the Miles Garrett's, the TJ Watts, Nick Bosa, those are the guys that, yeah, there, there's a small group of them that we, that we can. It's funny. It's like linebacker is the, you know, it's the mirror, right, of the running back. Like we we talk about, you know, if you do draft receivers early, like one of the nice things about drafting your line, your running backs late, is if they just get on the field and get the volume, you know, they can be in a really good situation where they yeah. can score the points. It does matter though. Like, like you've got to be in a league that really rewards, you know, the scoring format. So I have one other question on this one, you know, John, because like I know it's something that I think is maddening for my league mates. You know, say you've got a guy like um, like I have Miles Garrett, and I've been fortunate because he keeps playing defensive end. But mm-hmm. then they're, you know, these teams, they just come in and change, change schemes. And all of a sudden you go to three, four, if you're now playing a three, four and you're just getting an outside linebacker, that's not going to get all the tackles. They're only going to get the sacks and in the scoring format is not set up to like support like an edge rusher. And a lot of these sites don't track edge rushers. They just, right. t- they just track them as def- you're either playing defensive line or they're not like, I can show you my phone right now. It's because I'm a commissioner in one of these leagues and it's got like five things on here of people being like, what? Like NFL.com's got so-and-so listed as a linebacker right now. And they're, they're pissed, right? Oh, yeah. Because they've built their <laughs> rosters the way you say. And now like their top player on their defense like it was just totally like like everything that they were building is is basically out the window because it's it, as much as good as these guys are if you have to play them at linebacker depending on your scoring format like it's not as good so is there a way that you handle that what are your thoughts yeah so the the way that i kind of address it in in like rankings and stuff because it it this happens every off season right and and there doesn't really seem to be a specific rhyme or reason. Like we know like three, four uh, base, four, three base, those are interchangeable. They're not like something that a team really plays full time. They play both. Um, so yeah, this, this off season, I, I remember the big ones. I mean, J- uh, Joey Bosa, Daniel Hunter, Max Crosby all got moved from defensive end to linebacker and that kills them, right? These are top guys, but the way that uh, I put the rankings and the way that you can kind of set up your league, depending on the the site that you play on uh, my fantasy league, MFL, for example, you can uh, use like a true position tool uh, to set your, your league up for all edge rushing linebackers to get a defensive end uh, classification and then all off ball linebackers to be the ones that are uh, considered linebackers. So that that's kind of the way that we, we try to work around it. And most of my leagues now have kind of made that switch to a true position league. Um, Adam Zekas uh, from DLF.com. He's the one that put together a little tool that actually converts uh, all those off ball linebacker or uh, edge rushing linebackers to defensive ends. So that's been super helpful. Yeah. So there's a tool like that out there because guess what? As the commissioner, they ask me and I like, as soon as someone in them said, we should just have an edge defender, you know, designation. And I said, yes, we should comma, not it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to be the one to have to track it and keep up with every single one of these. Um, but, but yeah, I love what you said. So if there's, what was the guy, what was the person's name again? So his name is Adam Zekas, uh, Dicky Z on Twitter. He's from DLF, but I could send you the link. DLF. And, and, no, it's cool. Yeah, Just so people know DLF, because yeah. I'm sure some people are going to hear this and they've had the same maddening moment like that right. I've had. <laughs> so one real quick thing, like while we're talking about, you know, the defensive lineman, man, I, again, I love what you did with the tiers. Um, so if you want to just kind of maybe help people understand it. So like your tier one, you talk about, okay, they're going to have the volume, meaning they're going to have enough snaps because some, some pass rushers are specialists, right? They're going to get their sacks, but they're not out there enough to maybe either get high volume sacks or they're not going to get any tackles, right? Or tackles right. for losses to, to go along with, um, the sacks, right? So you talk about volume plus pressure rate plus 
plus a pass rush grade. So you're kind of like, you know, Hey, here's, here's their, you know, the team they play on, they're going to have the volume. And then here's basically the way I look at it. You're saying those last two things that are, ta- are is, is talent. So you're saying tier one are the guys that like are going to have the elite volume and they've also got the elite talent and they're coming together in the middle. So these should be the ones you go after first. So just kind of help people understand like how you came up with that. And then if you want to just mention a few of the guys you like in tier one, uh, that maybe, maybe, if you're looking at another, you know, site for IDP, maybe they wouldn't have them this high. Maybe there's some guys that you're a little higher than everyone else on. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, utilizing some of the advanced pass rush metrics that that we have on the site um, is is a big help in in trying to determine uh, future sacks. Right. I think um, things like pass rush grade, uh, win rate, pressure rate, all those kind of things they actually matter, and then obviously volume as well. So because these defensive linemen are are guys that are going head to head with blockers, usually big offensive linemen on every single snap, they actually have to be good at their position um, to, to produce consistently and, and not rely on like a a quarterback running into them or um, the quarterback, not throwing the ball for five seconds so that they can get there. Right. They need to be able to win consistently so that we can rely on some of their sack numbers. Um, and, and like I said, there are a lot of good edge players out there, but not a lot of them um, can put up the sack numbers that some of the elite guys can. And, and even some of the elite guys, you know, have have struggles with putting up sacks as well, which kind of tells you uh, how unstable that that sack production could be. Somebody like Max Crosby last year, for example. I think he just had the eight sacks on the year, but he he was our our league leader in pressures and had one of the highest pass rush grades in the league. So uh, it doesn't always equal that way. There's going to be outliers, but for the most part, that's that's the most stable way to to kind of attack the position um, if you're looking for that production. And and somebody like Rashawn Gary, for example, is it was somebody that I was a lot higher on uh, coming into this season than than uh, people than other people were, and and. People are slowly catching up to that now, I think. But um, he he was a big one for me, for sure. What about Marcus Davenport, I have to ask? Like, yeah, that was Davenport. one that that one immediately popped out to me. Like, he's number 10. Yeah, yeah. So he, he, he was never somebody that I was particularly high on in previous years. And then last season really kind of started to turn it on. And, you know, it for defensive line, it's weird. It takes guys some time to develop once they get to the NFL. They don't always hit the ground running like a Nick Bosa, for example. Um, It it takes them a few years to kind of hit their stride and and develop into these elite tier pass rushers. And for Davenport, it seemed to happen last year and he did miss some time in there. So we didn't get to see the full picture of what he can do, but he still put up nine sacks and and some some pretty elite numbers for uh, pass rushers, even on uh, a limited uh, sample size. Although um, he played enough and, and and that's another one of those guys that's in an every down role and uh, an ascending player in my opinion speaking of an every down role cowboys superstar micah freaking parsons like <laughs> I, I i can't remember ever seeing a rookie be that dominant that yeah. quickly in the nfl and you accordingly you know say that he does deserve to be a top five linebacker with that said you know you do bring up some good reasons about why his production might not be quite as much of a slam dunk as everyone might think what's your overall kind of profile on michael parsons and like what role would you if you know if if you could coach the cowboys defense like just so you could <laughs> optimize his fantasy points like how would you like to see parsons be used Oh man. I, I mean, well, for fantasy points, just stick him at linebacker and, and hope that, you know, he can put up tackles, but, uh, and just kind of blitz him at a, at a lower rate and, and then hope that he still converts. But, um, I, as an NFL coach, I think just lining him up on the edge makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I take a lot of shit for for Parsons because I talk about it a lot. But um, you guys talk about it too, you know, not hating the player necessarily, but hating the ADP, right? So yeah. um, for for redraft, you're you're looking at a guy that you, if you want him on your team, you're going to have to draft him as the first or second linebacker off the board. Um, but a lot of the times, there's still top tier offensive players on the board as well. So I don't think that's necessarily a bet you'd want to make, and and. The reason for that is because he does play that that dual role. So uh, as much as he is a very good pass rusher and he was that last season, I think people will automatically pencil him in for double digit sacks again, which uh, first off is tough for any player to repeat. And and even considering um, his elite pass rush metrics, he still has a pretty high pressure to sack conversion rate at over 19%, which could create some real regression in that in that category. And um if he wasn't able to maintain that level of a pass rush repertoire and, 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 
pass rush grade, et cetera. Um, not saying he can't, but even if he does, there's there's a lot more that kind of goes into compiling sack totals than just being good. So you have to be lucky as well. And in a part-time role as a pass rusher, that's a pretty big ask for him to maintain that level of production with a much smaller opportunity than your typical full-time pass rusher um, who even they have a hard time hitting double digit sacks. Um, and, and that's not even to take into account how it affects his tackle totals, right? As, as a linebacker, by spending more time rushing the passer, it, it delivers a substantial hit to his tackle efficiency um, combined with playing in what's likely going to be another season uh, in a man heavy defense, which also saps uh, linebacker tackle efficiency as well. So it, it's, there's red flags there as far as what he can produce, but I, I get it. I mean, the ceiling is there. It's just that the floor might be uh, pretty low as well and not necessarily something you, you'd want to, take a swing at super early for for a linebacker. Dwayne, this sounds like exactly why I'm kind of fading Debo Samuel as a top 15 pick. Like the rushing stuff is cool. The pass rushing stuff is cool. But in the game we're playing in fantasy football, we would rather have linebacker snaps and targets. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at, you know, John's rankings, like you'll see like, you know, where he has Parsons, you know, uh, rank 13 right now, he's in tier two, right? So, uh, but what I wanted to get at real quick with you, John, is like, you know, I love what you've got here uh, talking about the again, the tiers and the way you break things down. And you, you know, you talk about tier one being every down rolls and linebacker friendly defenses. And so why don't you tell folks like what does a what does a linebacker friendly defense look like? Because I, I thought this was really cool what you had uncovered about this. Yeah. So so one of the biggest things for, you know, trying to predict tackle efficiency is not necessarily the the player itself but the this defensive scheme that they play in right so um we found that you know when comparing a uh, zone defense versus man defense linebacker tackle efficiency is uh substantially higher um and then when you add in things like uh specific coverages within those defenses so cover two for example the past three years cover two is as yielded like a tackle efficiency up above 15 percent uh every single year the average being like 12 percent for for your typical linebacker so and what, is, what like does that, tackle efficiency mean for people like what, what does that number represent right so that's just how many tackles um a player per can snap. make with it yeah per snap basically okay. um so cool. yeah like a, a hundred snaps a player should have you know somewhere between 10 and 12 it's like targets per route run it's it's tackles per snap there we go <laughs> exactly yeah Love yeah it. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so finding those defenses that um, allow for for positive tackle efficiency is is an advantage to kind of take uh, to take into account for for trying to predict who the next uh, high scoring tacklers are going to be. And obviously, volume uh, plays a big part of that. You want guys that play every down, and uh, you need them to be healthy as well. But that's not something that we can control. So, so it makes perfect sense to me. Like yeah. if you can drop back and you get to have your and Ian, you would know. Like you're the linebacker here. You get to drop well, back, right? Yeah, you don't have to turn your head and run with the guy. You can focus yep. on everything at the line. So when the quarterback takes off and runs or checks it down, you pounce on that. You're not freaking 20 yards downfield trying to hang with the guy that's faster, athletic, and like more better looking than you. <laughs> yeah. And that <laughs> and that, that was the bitterness. thing. <laughs> <laughs> That was the thing with Micah Parsons last year. Like I said, like the linebacker tackle efficiency on average was around 12%. For him, it was like 8% um, in, in just an off-ball role because it was such a man-heavy defense um, with, with the Cowboys. I think they were first or, or second in the league in man man coverages. So um, With they, the NFL, with, with so many teams running zone, like, you know, most teams do run zone. We've got a few that really run man-heavy. Um, is it something where you've seen it really be sticky year over year? Like if a defense is a man coverage defense, they really stay that way. Cause I was kind of looking at some of this and like, I would see it with some teams, but others like, I was like, well, wow. I mean, they just flip back and forth like three different years. They were zone. Then they were man. Then they were zone. I mean, I don't yeah. know. It, does it come back to corners? What does it come back to? Yeah, it could be. And then defensive coordinator changes and things like that. It all, it all kind of depends on who they have, um, calling their defense. But, um, yeah, I haven't really noticed that like, for for certain defensive coordinators, they definitely stick to a, to a certain um, scheme. Like you think about somebody like Gus Bradley, for example, that is uh, you know super uh, rooted in in cover three. Um, he's been basically carrying that with him wherever he goes. So it just I think depends on whoever that defensive coordinator ends up being. Do you have five or so teams like that you've seen consistently just pound zone and like you know if you see a late round linebacker just from this team, you're like okay, sign me up. 
Yeah, yeah, Atlanta is a big one for me. I mean, Deion Jones and, and Foye Luakon last year were, were solid IDPs. Neither of those guys are there this year, so there's like a little bit of ambiguity around the who's going to start and whatnot, but Rashawn Evans looks like he's going to be locked into an every-down role in a super linebacker-friendly defense. He's somebody that you can get really, really late in drafts, and then whoever ends up Jesus, I just released him, John. I just released him last night. I <laughs> what had are you do doing, Dwayne? I had to do my keeper cuts. <laughs> And I freaking I'm an idiot because I didn't read enough of John's stuff first. So anyway, <laughs> well, you should on. be able. I, to I don't want to talk get about this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! So what, I, what guys do you have here, John? Like just real quick, like on because I know people love the linebackers. Like you want to talk about a couple of these guys? I, I know you got Bobby Wagner up top, which you know old you know boomers like me like we love seeing Bobby Wagner's name. Um, but some people might be kind of surprised. You know, he's a little older, playing with sure. the Rams now. And just any of the other guys that you just want to point out that maybe someone's not thinking about really being one of these top notch linebackers, they may be surprised to see them on your list. Yeah. So yeah, Bobby Wagner. Um, I mean, he's my LB one. I, I, and again, it comes back to the, the, the scheme that uh, the Rams run. It's, it's again, rooted in, in zone coverages. And it also helps playing behind uh, a defensive line with Aaron Donald on it, who eats up a lot of attention on the offensive line and, and cleans up uh, space for linebackers to, to make tackles in behind him that, We've seen, you know, Corey Littleton and, and Kenny Young and Troy Reader be effective IDPs uh, for for the Rams, but Bobby Wagner obviously is a much better player and, and can uh, can truly benefit from that. So I'm banking on him being my LB one. Um, outside of him, I think, you know, again, betting on guys like a Foye Aluakon is is risky because he's not typically a great uh, NFL linebacker and he's going to a new team, but. The, the Jaguars themselves brought in Mike Caldwell, who was the linebackers coach for the Buccaneers, who were another linebacker friendly team rooted in zone and cover two. Um, so there's a good chance that Foye Luakon, uh, just as a result of being on the field, could see that tackle efficiency from from last season at least come close to what it was uh, again this season. So I, I do like him quite a bit. Um, and, and the same with guys like Jordan Brooks um, and even Cody Barton, who's the second linebacker in Seattle, uh, has, has a really good opportunity to produce in, in a friendly defense there as well. How uh, how much do you kind of change what you expect the scheme to be based on that week's individual matchup? Like we did see last year, you know, when the Dolphins played the Ravens and they just said, all right, yeah. we're going to run cover zero <laughs> freaking 30 times uh, today. Is that something that's more of like outlier situations like that? Or do you like really wait it week to week? I mean, it can happen. It, it's definitely, yeah. The, I mean, the Dolphins won. They, they blitz their players quite a bit, anyways. I think they were they were one of, they were one of the most blitz heavy teams in the league. But um, that one was that one was huge, obviously. So there are there are definitely outlier games that you have to kind of um, that catch you catch you by surprise, I guess. And um, as as far as looking at it week to week, it's not really major changes. The things that kind of affect that sometimes are when players are in and out of the lineup so uh last season the the washington football team at the time uh they were running uh cole holcomb and john bostick as as two full-time linebackers bostick got hurt they were going to put in their first round rookie Jamin davis we assumed it was going to be a full-time role again he wasn't quite ready to step into that starting role so they started to run a little bit more dime uh and shift their personnel a little bit that way so that that's where you kind of see it i think a little bit more so there was so, my first round pick last year. This really, this this podcast really is not good for me. Like <laughs> Jamin Davis yeah, did not live up to expectations. I, I cut a linebacker that's going to apparently tackle a lot. So anyway, so thanks, John. No, no I was no I was just laughing. Like <laughs> all right, so like Washington apparently also plays their starting linebackers on every single snap. They did the same thing with their tight ends, but God forbid you nope. get the three down <laughs> running back. You know, yeah, yeah. a pretty big role. <laughs> My goodness. All right, John, if, for the YouTubers out there, they can see the lovely Derwin James jersey you have right there over your shoulder. The man just got paid number one safety in the game, and it seems pretty unanimous at this point. Now, watching the Chargers use him just all over the field, I mean, it really is one of the more unique, I think, just experiences just zeroing on him all game. Does this kind of do it all roll where one snap he's, you know, at the line of scrimmage, one snap he's playing center field? Does that make him a bit of a unicorn in IDP land? Because, again, from our conversation so far, it really seems like most of the time in the early mid-rounds we're focusing on linebackers and defensive linemen. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I think it, it definitely helps him. There there probably isn't a more versatile player in the league than Derwin, and, and 
Brandon Staley said it, right? He's not a safety. He's an impact player. And that has mm-hmm. translated into IDP production and value. And uh, the way that the Chargers deploy him, you know, plays to his strengths as the impact player, putting him in the best position possible to possible to produce as long as he's healthy obviously but uh, I'm also a big believer that the Chargers are going to give Derwin an uptick in in opportunities as their second linebacker more often than not this season just judging by the way that they've approached their offseason they didn't address the linebacker position really Troy Reader's you know just a guy Kyle Van Noy more of a hybrid player Kenneth Murray still struggling to pick up the defense and they went even they went heavy towards, you know, adding starting caliber defensive backs like JC Jackson, Bryce Callahan, uh, JT Woods in the third round out of Baylor, um, because I think Staley does want to utilize a similar defense to what he did during his time with the Rams, deploying more dime personnel and allowing a player like Derwin to come down and play that linebacker role or closer to the line of scrimmage, sc- line of scrimmage should which should yield a, a big boost for his tackle efficiency compared to your your typical safety. You know, John, one thing I noticed with, you know, safeties, it kind of similar to what we talked about with linebackers. But you have a good safety one year, and then all of a sudden, like, maybe the other veteran that's on the team is gone. They bring in a young player. And then the next their, next year, all of a sudden, that guy that you had that was getting to play in the box, they're racking up tackles. It's like now they're the that's the person they're trusting in deep coverage <laughs> because yeah. they know that they know, like, they just trust them, right? The coordinator's like, number one thing, can't get burned deep, right? And so all of a sudden, you have a guy like it may, it could be a, a Derwin James or a Jeremy Chen, even though they're really built to be, you know, these guys that, you know, should be in the box, you know, and just destroying, you know, plays at the line of scrimmage. Now all of a sudden, like they're the guy that has to play deep. Is that something that you really look at and you and and like how do you how do you kind of project for that? When you see that kind of dynamic occur, is it something that like makes you kind of raise an eyebrow and be like, oh, okay, maybe we really should think, you know, more about whether or not we put this particular, you know, safety uh, you know, up top because we don't know for sure if they're gonna get to play in the box as much as they did last year. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, just the way that the NFL is, is using their safeties, there's not really like a typical box safety anymore. Like it, it, it varies from, from team to team, but um, often, oftentimes the two safeties are there. They'll interchange in that role kind of, and it's not always that we have like one safety that stays deep and one safety safety that rotates down, but it's definitely something that you have to project, um, you know, looking at, at the team's rosters and depth charts to try to figure out uh, who is going to be the deep guy, who's going to come down and rotate more. And I, all those kind of little tiebreakers make the difference in, in where you want to draft these guys and where you want to rank them and things like that, because that, that box role or those, at least those box snaps, um, they do create a higher tackle efficiency and, and are better for IDP than the guys that just stay up 25 yards um, in front of the line of scrimmage because uh, the, the action's not coming to them as much. So it sounds like, our, your, oh, sorry, sorry. I was going to say, so it sounds like our ability to kind of predict tackle situations is far superior than any sort of pass breakup coverage metrics. So cornerbacks, even for cornerbacks and safeties, then we should really just be focusing on their chance to rack up tackles. Absolutely. Yeah. The big play stuff we found has been pretty unstable. It's it's hard to it's it's hard to kind of narrow in on. There's there's certain guys who are good at um, you know, getting hands on the ball and, and things like that. So it's a little bit more sticky for certain players, but as a whole, interceptions, things like that, um, force fumbles, all that kind of stuff is is a really super uh makes sense. Unstable metric. Yeah. Does the man coverage stuff that you talked about translate over to the safeties and you know decreasing the efficiency as well? Because I, I see Look, I've been I've been trying for two years on Brandon Jones. Um, you know, he's he's obviously been kind of stuck in a rotation. There's been some injuries. Yeah. You know, he plays for the Dolphins. They are the number one man defense, maybe number two. New England may have beat them, but they're like a top two man defense in the league. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it 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 can. It, I don't think it's a, it's not as much as with the with the linebackers. I think for Brandon Jones mostly it was, you know, just the lack of playing time. Like you said, the rotation with with Eric Rowe there, Javon Holland played the deep role. But the good things with, with Jones is that they they let him play in the box for the large majority of his snaps. So he kind of made up a little bit for the lack of volume with some tackle numbers and uh big plays like sacks, but I think yeah, it was only like 64% of snaps, something like that, that he played last season. So he, you know, if, if we could get rid of Eric Rowe or at least let him get on the field more Jones uh, then we could see uh, at least a better season I, I think he could be a breakout candidate if, if that's the case 
As I was going through your cornerback tiers, the, the IDP novice that I am, I was just expecting, you know, Trayvon Diggs to be at the top. The guy gets his hand on those interceptions, takes all the risks, but nope, it is Kenny Moore. And just, <laughs> you know, up to your point, you were saying it's been this way for quite a bit. So even with the cornerbacks, man, the kind of transitioning from safeties to corners, same thing. We're just looking for zone corners that actually give a damn about run support, huh? Yeah, that's that's definitely part of it. We don't necessarily want like the best NFL corners uh, for IDP for for whatever reason, just, you know, if they're <laughs> maybe not targeted as much, they're not as good at tackling. Um, it, we just want the guys that are on the field can produce some tackle numbers. And for Kenny Moore specifically, you know, he's a guy uh, that that would line up in the slot. He'd line up closer to the line of scrimmage. Uh, he'd get some blitz attempts. He was, and he's a really good tackler. He that's, that's one of his strengths. And, and he's been producing numbers like that because of his role in that defense. And, um, Look, I, I'm probably not taking Kenny Moore in any drafts just because of where he goes, but uh, I'm not taking any corner in most drafts till the very end because there's just it, – it's the the most volatile and deep position in, in IDP, and, and you can wait till the end to find basically a full-time guy, um, somebody – you know, a couple guys I like, Kendall Fuller in Washington and Sidney Jones in Seattle. Both those guys are, are locked into every down roles. They're good tacklers. They have a high forced incompletion percentage. If you are looking for a stable metric that can get you big plays like pass breakups and and, uh, and interceptions, things like that. But um, the, the cost for a Trayvon Diggs, people hoping that those interceptions will replicate this season, it, it's just not worth it. Great stuff all the way around, John. I feel like we've done a good job you know, going through defensive line, linebackers, safeties, and corners. So now just getting a little broader. You have had you know some good bold take articles out there. So let's get bold, man. Now I'm, I'm not so sure our listeners and Dwayne and I are going to exactly know what constitutes being bold here. So <laughs> knock yourself out, man. But give me a bold rookie IDP take that you know you feel is maybe going against the grain of the IDP uh, the IDP masses. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's bold. I, I think most people are, are kind of getting in on this as well, but um, sticking in Indianapolis, just talking about Kenny Moore, but I think the their third round safety out of Maryland, Nick Cross, uh, I think has a really good shot at becoming a top 12 uh, IDP safety this season. And he's currently the front runner to take over for the recently retired uh, Kyrie Willis as Gus Bradley's strong safety, which has been a very IDP friendly role for the safety that can lock that down for the year. Um, you think about Jonathan Cyprian in Jacksonville, Derwin James, of course, Jonathan Abram just last year um, had his best season as well. And, and the reason for that is because uh, I had mentioned it before, but Bradley deploys a very predictable defense that is rooted in single high looks, specifically cover three more than any other team in the league. So keeping one safety deep, which is likely Julian Blackman, uh, and the other rotating down towards the line of scrimmage on the large majority of their snaps is a big boost for tackle efficiency, hitting over 10% while the other deep roll hovers closer to 8 or 9%. It makes a big difference across an entire season. Obviously, the first step is locking down that role. I think it's a big ask for a rookie, so that kind of makes it uh bold but he's he's been impressing in camp as they say with every rookie and and he started the first preseason game uh doing so even earning uh 89.1 overall grade for us as well so there's there's signs there that he can be that guy in year one it's funny, like there's been kind of these moments in non-IDP fantasy where like, you know, the Falcons for like four straight years were just allowing the most like receptions to running backs. And some people will mistake that, like, oh, they're so bad against running backs. Like, <laughs> well, no, they're basically asking the team to like dump it down in front of them yeah. and just, you know, have a chance to rally up. So good to hear that, you know, Gus Bradley and some other defenses, similar mannerisms. So who do you think will lead the NFL in intercept interceptions as well as sacks? And I say that knowing that these are two unstable <laughs> metrics but you know it does sound like things like pressure and uh you know i think it was incompletion force rate or i, yep. I forget that stat you said we do have some underlying metrics that can maybe help us find some good odds here yeah for sure and i, I think these probably qualify as both takes too like you said just because uh, i'd be crazy to, to kind of bet any substantial money on this actually happening but uh, I'm gonna go for as far as interceptions go I'm going with Marshawn Lattimore uh, of the New Orleans Saints and, and the reason for that is that he checks uh, some major boxes when it comes to creating turnover opportunities for cornerbacks and that 
I mean, first off, he gets targeted a lot. And part of that is because he doesn't leave the field while he's also covering top options for the offense. But he's also su super sticky in coverage, um, which we see in his numbers since 2020. No corner has faced a lower percentage of what we consider open targets in, in that time at just 29.5%. So he's in position to make plays on the ball. And he also that also shows in his force and completion percentage uh, as well, recently posting the highest forced incompletion incompletion percentage among cornerbacks just last season at 20.2 percent so like i said it's near impossible to pre predict ints but Lattimore has as good a shot as any if not better at doing so uh this year uh, i i've loved watching Lattimore play over the years by the way like him darius slay you know peterson or his prime there's only a handful of guys that were actually getting these shadow cornerback matchups and really not even getting much help over the top so that's that's the one thing man like it, it ticks me off so much when we see guys like I remember Slay a couple years ago was getting beat up a little bit there but it's yeah. like do you know how good you have to be to even get that assignment in the first place let alone like actually do something with it oh man I, I couldn't imagine being an NFL cornerback I, I could barely do it when I play like just casual football it's, <laughs> it's impossible <laughs> short memory <laughs> required yeah <laughs> all right so do you have a sack leader you're looking at yeah so for sacks uh I went with Joey Bosa you know not Another really Buckeye. Like, Let's go. Yeah, not like a true dark horse name or anything, but uh, you consider he's never posted more than 12 and a half sacks in a season. And maybe that makes it a bit bolder. But um, as far as like all the advanced pass rush metrics, he's been top three in the NFL in terms of um, those pass rush metrics that matter since 2019, which includes a 92.0 pass rush grade, 22.1% win rate, 16.4% pressure rate. Then he added 48 quarterback hits in that time as well. So he's getting super close. Those are all top three three marks for for his position in that time uh you add in somebody like Khalil Mack to play opposite him who has been kind of instrumental in creating sacks for his teammates since 2016 I think he's fourth in the NFL in, ca in that category it could be uh, a career year in terms of sack production for Bosa and with a bit of sack luck it you know he's got a shot at leading the league Larry said, you know, you mentioned Khalil Mack who's helped me open up his teammates I remember looking down at one point last year and just being like uh freaking robert quinn has how many sacks 18 and oh, a half yeah. i feel like robert quinn man he just he plays his ass off like every three or four years he gets that next contract yeah. he chills waits for the contract <laughs> here goes to hell off again gotta respect it there all right one defensive player that you think will break out in a meaningful way this season break out can you know be open to interpretation as always yeah, yeah. So the way that I like to define it is a guy that, you know, he's going to at least uh, double his production from the year before, and it's it's going to continue into the into future years as well. So one guy that I like, we'll give the linebackers some love, and I'll, I'll say Jeremiah Wusu koromoa of the, the Cleveland Browns. Um, played less than 600 snaps last season as a rookie, uh, missed a couple games due to injury and, and a few games to work into a full-time role as well. But when he was out there, it, it was pretty clear he was the best linebacker on the field. He finished the season as a top 10 graded linebacker for us which is pretty impressive for a rookie um and he checks all the boxes that we want for our top idp linebackers right he's, he's ready for an every down roll in year two zone heavy defense top 10 first contact rate last season showing that he can be the first to the ball and, and rack up tackles just got to clean up the misses a little bit which is fine but he's a good pass rusher as well when they want to deploy him as a blitzer 18 percent pressure rate uh, which was top 10 for his position and helped him get in on a sack in three separate games so again as long as he's healthy i think jok could be in for a really big year and, and why i've why i have him ranked inside of my top 12 linebackers this season hey Guess john one other guy that i no, no, Dwayne, no, no, you got you pronunciation. Go. That was king shit, man. Yeah, that <laughs> take was some, king shit. Take some notes. And also, just I, I did see that Mike Renner, I remember in the draft process, was super high um, on Jock. Is that, is that the nickname we're going with? Yeah, J O K or, or okay. Jock. Yeah. Yeah. J O K. Yeah. So it's always it's always tough with Mike when it's a Notre Dame guy. Just like when oh, I yeah, preach, yeah. when I, when I say anything about Cordero Patterson, you got to take it with a grain of salt. But uh, really good stuff there. Owusu Koramau. There we go. Yeah, it seems like the guy would be a Jedi <laughs> or something. Like it sounds like something like yeah, that. Yeah. So Absolutely. you know, are there? And, and you may not have any of these. And this you know wasn't really on the script. Any guys though that are that are just changing teams this year that you're just super excited. You're like, wow, this is a big deal. Um, them moving teams is going to be a big thing for them. Maybe they were just an average performer before, or who knows? Maybe they didn't really have a role. But now that they've changed teams, it doesn't really matter which position. You just think they're going to be a much better positioned, you know, in 2022 to be successful in IDP. 
Yeah, yeah. Just, I mean, I'm sure I have a few, but the first name that came to mind was uh, Randy Gregory, uh, uh, edge mm. rusher for the Denver Broncos. And I, I know in, you know, non true Another sore leagues. subject. Thanks, John. Really yeah, appreciate yeah that, sorry. You know, as a Cowboys fan. <laughs> But uh, like he was a legitimately good pass rusher last year, and he was used in in more of like a, a DPR designated pass rusher role. Um, you know, the Broncos gave him a pretty big contract at five years, um, so th- I, I expect that he's going to be a pretty big part of that defense. But all of his advanced pass rush metrics uh, point to him being one of the better pass rushers in the league. And I think you know a heavier role on on early downs and against rundowns could help him kind of raise that floor a little bit and and put up some tackles as well in, in a team that that desperately needs some pass rush help. How did Jerry Jones let Gregory get out the door? Man? Isn't that like his – he's been talking about the war daddy pass rusher for years. Like that's exactly yeah. what Randy Gregory is there. My goodness. So, John, fantastic stuff. Three sleeper value types that folks in IDP draft should look to target late. Like just, you know, guys that will probably be there and they should be taken. Oh yeah, there, there's yeah, there's going to be a lot of guys that fall. One of the ones uh, for the edge position that stands out uh, almost every draft is Preston Smith uh, of the Green Bay Packers. This guy was uh, he's usually going outside of the top thirty or forty players at his position, despite kind of being arguably one of the top fifteen edge rushers last year as, as far as looking at the numbers that matter. He had sixty two pressures, fourteen point eight percent pressure rate, eighteen point one percent win rate. All of those are top fifteen. Um, he's getting overlooked because of age. Uh, and probably because of the ascending Rashawn Gary as well. I think that happens a lot uh, for some of these IDPs. People want the younger, sexier option, and, and these these old guys kind of get pushed to the curb uh, a little bit, but that makes them pretty good values a lot of uh, almost every year. So, um, yeah, Preston Smith's one for me on the edge. Uh, and then at safety, uh, uh, since I've kind of bashed on your Cowboys a little bit, I, I've, I'll, 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 I'll go with the positive one. Um, but I talked a bit about how the box heavy role is valuable for IDP safeties. J Ron curse of the Cowboys is someone who has a role like that locked up for the second straight year. Um, but because he doesn't necessarily carry the name value as some of the other safeties in the league, like Derwin, Jamal Adams, Minka Fitzpatrick, he can be had much later, but uh, is in a good, if not better spot to produce this coming season than, than a lot of guys. So um, we, we love that for our IDP safeties and curses is, is pretty easily had uh, way past those names as well. Uh, and one more, I guess uh, I'll do one for the DT required leagues. Um, that's defensive tackle required leagues Ed Oliver of the Buffalo bills, uh, kind of an intriguing name for me that I've seen go undrafted at times. And, and I know he hasn't lived up to the hype of a top 10 pick from a few years ago, but from week 10 on last year, he was top 10 in a pass rush grade for his position, as well as pressure rate and win rate. Uh, and by all accounts, it sounds like that's carried over into camp for him this offseason. So I think he could be like a true late breakout uh, for, for Ed Oliver in Buffalo. Love the J-Ron Curse call, particularly. He was just fun to watch last year. Dwayne, yeah. can you get – Dwayne, you, uh, I am 29 years old. Dwayne, can you guess my favorite Cowboys player growing up? Your favorite Cowboys player growing up was 2000s 2000s come on uh julius jones <laughs> roy williams why why would i bring yeah. up julius one, jones one the one i don't know one one biscuit shy of a linebacker <laughs> did they that have was, that, roy that was what bill parcell said about uh roy williams you know the first time a reporter asked him about roy and what he thought he said yeah, i think he's one biscuit short of a linebacker <laughs> <laughs> they did have two i'm pretty sure safety roy williams just literally wrote roy williams like the entire full name on the back of, of his jersey but bro uh, they literally you know horse collar tackle is the roy williams rule pretty much that dude oh my god you can you can still pull up the pod boom highlight video on the grainy old youtube and have a hell of a 10 minutes that's all i'm gonna say john one general tip for anyone slash Dwayne entering their first idp <laughs> um i mean i guess the main like aside from just knowing your scoring because like we said it does vary from league to league there's you know leagues that heavily favor tackles like the favor sacks leagues that don't reward idps very highly at all and everything in between i think the most important thing to know is opportunity is king right high volume roles uh lead to fantasy relevancy more often than not especially at the linebacker position so following the snaps finding out who those guys are that are on uh on the field the most is going to be a big uh, advantage for you week to week and then uh, just like a personal rule that has made my ID team, 
IDP teams that most successful is don't chase unstable stats like sacks and interceptions. Instead, focus on the context as to why those numbers occur uh, or don't, and then draft and set your lineups accordingly. So, um, yeah, obviously there's there's more to it than that, but uh, you know if you want more detail, you could read anything I've written on PFF.com to get uh, a better idea of which IDPs separate themselves from that massive pack of defensive players. At PFF underscore Macri on Twitter, and yeah, the man is grinding and will be continuing to do so all season long. That's the thing, man. I was, Dwayne and I were joking about this earlier, like all the work for the drafts, and then the season starts, and it's like, okay. oh boy, just uh, <laughs> just beginning. Dwayne, do you have anything else for John? No, man, just seriously want to, and not just because you're at PFF, just want to, you know, compliment you on your work. It's freaking fabulous. Uh, I, I feel like I'm going to be in good shape for tomorrow, even though I'm just, you know, I, I hate to say it. I'm only just now studying for it or, you know, it's going to be on Saturday. So tomorrow I will definitely be reading, rereading through everything that you have and I'm going to be going off your ranks. Now, uh, hopefully no one from my league will hear this by the time, you know, that that happens so that they're not just sniping players, you know, from me. <laughs> I appreciate it. That 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 means a lot. I'm I'm, I'm glad that uh, anybody enjoys my work, but it means it means a lot coming from you guys. We're gonna have to delay putting this pot out just so Dwayne has a small. <laughs> no, that means, like, Ian, that means Ian will release it early. That's what that means. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably like it'll, the we'll have like a call to like you know all <laughs> league mates of at Dwayne McFarland. Like, listen to this. Just snipe his ass. <laughs> probably like your lowest like buy in league, just some home one, and we are gonna make sure we screw <laughs> you over, Dwayne. For John, for Dwayne, I'm Ian. Thanks as always for tuning in the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. Until next time, take care.